All right, game number four. So second game for you, Mario. And this time you're playing with the black piece. So let me flip the board and let's get started. It is the Hamanov variation, bishop e2. Okay, not the most ambitious I've seen. Okay, now bishop e7. Bishop e7 was a little bit unusual for me, but probably doesn't make a difference to the more standard knight of six. You might have your own reasons why you start with bishop e7, but uh, okay. Let's keep going. Knight of six, queen d2, b5, knight takes, d takes, bishop f3. Now you give a mistake to e5, which I don't think is a mistake at all. Um, this looks very normal, e5. Good move to stop e5 from white and the bishop on f3 looks stupid now. You can develop your bishop to e6. I mean, it looks like you have achieved everything you, you want out of this opening, pretty much. Rook a d1, bishop e6, a3, castle. This is all good. Rook f d8, queen e3. Mm. And now you go a5, which is quite possible. I also looked at ace h6, which would be another natural move to play, bishop h4. And now you have this interesting idea to take on d1 and white cannot take back with the rook because of knight g4 hitting both the bishop and the queen. And if white takes, then suddenly his rook is under attack and he will lose a pawn right here. <coughs> Excuse me. So after rook takes d1, white probably needs to take with the knight and then you can claim the d file. So this was also possible and it's also a little bit better for black. But he went a5, I also like this move to be honest, uh, having this idea before, gaining some more space, all looks good. And now why well, takes an f6 anyway, just like that. I don't know why, but just gives you the bishop pair. Very nice. Now you go rook ac8. I'm guessing that this is kind of a calculation uh, mistake because you could just go bishop e7. Um, like you also pointed out in the comment. And white needs to go back. To, he cannot do anything else. Probably what you and your opponent thought was that he can go knight takes b5. But after queen b7. Um, he will lose a piece. Either of the knight d6, <clears throat> you can go probably different moves, but um, well, it seems queen d7 is the simplest, yeah? And this pin will cost him a piece. Yeah, looks pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and if rook takes d8, Rook takes d8, queen a7, maybe this is what you were afraid of, that he has this little trick. But now you can just go rook b8. And okay, white doesn't lose a piece here, but he ends up in, a, in an endgame, which is much, much better for you um, with the active rook. White is losing another pawn because you're attacking too. And this might be close to lost already, honestly, against the bishops here. Um, looks terrible for white. So after bishop e7, he needs to go back to e3, and then obviously this queen c5 move was completely useless. Okay, also after rook a c8, you keep a much better position. Rook takes d8, bishop takes d8, rook d1, bishop e7, queen e3, and now you go rook a8, and this is clearly a tactical mistake. Also, I'm not completely sure what you want to achieve with this move. Um, in general, it feels like to me it's time to make some space for the king. So I would consider either h6 or g6 here definitely. But probably g6 makes more sense as you have a dark square bishop and white doesn't. So you can just put your king on g7, will be very safe. And then you can continue expanding maybe b4, maybe a4, whereas white really doesn't have a lot of counterplay. So. This looks like a very comfortable position, play king g7. You can maybe trade rooks, maybe not. Um, it's up to you. You can also go after something like rook b8. 
many different options definitely and very comfortable for black yeah unfortunately here after rook a8 um white has this tactical solution to the position so wherever you are i mean a position looks so quiet like nothing is going to happen right and then suddenly there's an d5 damn it so you always need to be on the lookout you always need to be alert to those tactical ideas it's just just so important in chess because that really that changes everything if you see those tactics all the time you you gain you win so many more games or not lose so many more games because um you don't give these easy shots or any any shots to your opponent to to get an advantage or to to improve his position with knight d5 white is able to equalize here because well he uh changes the nature of the position completely and suddenly you have to look out right it's already uncomfortable for you a little bit uh, out of a practical viewpoint view, viewpoint <laughs> um because suddenly you have to defend and find precise moves before and you were so comfortable you could pretty much do whatever i mean why was just worse okay here you played rook f8 which is a mistake you need to go bishop d7 d6 queen d8 takes takes queen takes e5 you have the two bishops but white has two pawns and a rook so this is just balancing each other out but I understand that you maybe didn't want to play this because it looks it looks bad first but you can set up like this where the bishop is covering d8 this bishop is covering e8 and it seems like to me that white really cannot make progress here so that should be a draw yeah it seems like white cannot make progress simply <clears throat> so yeah you need to find uh, the most tenacious defense in those kind of situations and really especially if you are surprised by a move like knight d5 just dig in and take your time to find the best response rook f8 d takes e6 f takes rook e1 queen b6 rook f1 b4 so this is all Quite decent. Dum da dum da dum. Queen c7, bishop d4, rook f6, queen e8, e4. Okay, we can go through this pretty quickly because not too much is happening right here. But now we're coming to this endgame. This is this is such an important moment in this game. Um, because here you're playing a move after which you might be lost. Uh, this is not necessary in this uh, position. <coughs> you play g5 you have the right idea you you thought okay if i can trade rooks with opposite colored bishops it should be a draw but you need to be careful um since also end games of only opposite colored bishops can be winning if one side has enough past pawns so um before we see what's wrong with g5 what should you have done instead the idea is correct like i said but you have to implement it differently e5 is the way to go <clears throat> okay white has to try f takes e5 anything else doesn't make any sense rook takes king takes and now d3 is a strong move to push your pawn up to d2 where you can protect it and white always has to keep an eye on a pawn obviously with the bishop um, since otherwise you queen so let's see one sample variation bishop e6 makes sense to put the king in the worst spot bishop c2 king comes closer both kings approach <clears throat> and now you just wait pretty much put the bishop in a5 and nothing white can do really um, 
if this pawn wasn't here, he could go e6 and then run with his king over and it should be winning. But now in case white plays something like this, you can just go d1 queen and distract the bishop, win the pawn and then you, you can easily hold, of course, the bishop in c7 when white brings the king over to b7 and um, it's, you, you don't even have to play king d8, you can just stay on on right here and it's a draw because whenever white allows you can go king d6 so very very easy draw um so e5 was the way to go but of course this this requires some calculation i mean you could also play some like bishop c5 and then uh, d3 but this is more difficult definitely i mean this also works something like this check and d2 once again getting a pawn up to the second rank but here it still continues i mean maybe white can play some of rook b1 and with rooks on the board still always a little bit tricky so if you can uh, enforce matters right away then you should do that and you want to do but g5 seems to me it's the wrong way for some reason your pawn didn't take the pawn which i don't understand at all i mean obviously after king g2 he doesn't have any chance to win um so he needed to play f takes g5 and now i think rook takes f1 just loses and this end game seems to me just just lost we can go through the variation i checked here white brings the king and well what to do now i mean if you just sit and wait while well, white will play h4 bishop e4 and go after this pawn and even if you even if you trade it uh let's say bishop f8 bishop e4 h6 uh white has two two pawns here and he also still has this one so this is completely lost um and if you play king f5 to go after this pawn white just takes on d4 and he, he even plays king e5 um, I think even if your king was on f7, this position would be lost because white can build, white can create um, two pass pawns and your bishop cannot stop them both. I mean, in general, it's like that in these opposite colored bishop endgames that if some positions with two pawns, when one side has two more pawns, are actually drawn because the bishop is on the same diagonal as both pawns. Um, he can stop them both but here that's not the case mm. I'm thinking if I can somehow show it but not really it's not really that easily possible to show it right now but here this is just seems to be lost yeah this is lost so you would need to play rook g6 here <clears throat> h4 and h6 maybe this was your idea to to trade some pawns here but white can go rook e1 now and go after this pawn you cannot go king f7 because of bishop h5 and uh h6 g5 h5 rook f6 rook takes e6 and i think this this end game might be once again lost without these pawns would be a draw of course because then you could just sacrifice the bishop for this pawn and uh, keep your king on h8 and white has the wrong bishop but um, in this case there's still the pawns on the board so sacrificing this bishop against the pawn will not work because it just wins for white and otherwise white will bring the king i mean maybe that there's still some way to draw but uh, I can't really imagine. I mean, white plays g4, brings the king. What to do? You have to keep an eye on both pawns and um, you can't do it. No, it should be lost. So you would need to play rook f7 here, but um, well, white has these two pass pawns. Um, he definitely has, has winning chances here for sure maybe rook e5 now i mean this looks this looks very very suspicious 
threatening bishop e6, threatening rook takes g5. This would have been very, very uh, difficult for you if he took on g5. Mm. So, yeah, with such a move, you need to be super careful and very sure that the. I mean, I guess that you want to go for the bishop endgame, but maybe you were too. Mm, you were too. Um, stereotypical in your thinking that opposite color bishop endgames are all drawn uh, and since you're only one pawn down maybe this is what you're thinking you're just one pawn down uh, this is a draw but it matters a lot where those pawns are and uh, the more pass pawns your pawn has the the worse it is for you because with pass pawns uh, he creates a winning chance and his bishop can always stop your your pawns so um one needs to keep that in mind for sure but fortunately fortunately your opponent didn't take on g5 but played king g2 and now of course <laughs> you're not even a pawn down uh, so just an easy draw now <coughs> excuse me all right so what can we say about this game the opening worked out beautifully for you. You got a very nice position uh, with the bishops, but then uh, some tactical mistakes crept in. Well, first, not pushing out the queen immediately with bishop e7 of the queen c5, which was just possible. And then, of course, rook a8, which allowed this knight d5 move, and that turned the tables. Um, for your opponent's favor and then you had to be precise already to maintain equality which you didn't spot or maybe you misevaluated this position with the pawn on d6 um, with the where you have the two bishops and white is the rook and then i think you defended um, quite well with the opposite color bishops right up until the end game where this g5 move uh, could have been a game losing move i mean maybe maybe there's some defense after that but um i think practically just very difficult and uh, that was just not necessary at all so i think this is the big biggest lesson to take away if you're forcing some kind of end game like you were here pretty much forcing it but somehow your opponent didn't didn't <laughs> didn't think it was forcing it uh, because he didn't take on g5 but you if you're forcing some kind of end game with not a lot of not a lot of pieces left especially pawn end games but also bishop end games of any sort of bishop against knight you really have to make sure that the result you want out of this end game is actually also the objective result and in this case of course you want to draw but uh, it seems to me that the bishop endgame after rook takes f1 is, is lost <coughs> so just always check that <laughs> before you go into such end games all right so what can you do what can you improve what can you work on well i think from both games we saw this one and the last one um it seems also just like for the king hunter you can definitely work on your tactics much more um, I, w I don't think that openings are a big problem i mean in the first game you had a little little issue which your opponent didn't really exploit but okay it wasn't really a big deal anyway it was not a big deal um, but the big differences we saw here in terms of um evaluation where you play a move and <laughs> the evaluation drops uh, <clears throat> in your opponent's favor or goes up in your opponent's favor um where tactics with rook a8 and um then also okay this this g5 move i guess it's more a matter of of, of end game knowledge i would say um, and not so much but maybe also a little bit of calculation and maybe also not not considering this e5 move because 
if you see e5 then it makes much more sense to to push e5 and that the two pawns are much closer because then you can control them both i mean this is what you want is that the the pass pawns of your opponent are close together in opposite colored bishop end games so that um your bishop can can keep them both in check okay all right mario i hope that was helpful please let me know if you have any questions as always and thanks for your games thanks for supporting me through patreon same goes to king hunter of course thanks a lot for your continuous support and to everybody else thanks for watching i'll check the chat one last time to see if there are any questions yes there's a question by ian tactics are the key from today indeed all right what do i recommend as a tactics trainer phone app or chess book doing it with board and pieces nicholas yes that's a great question that i get a lot um how to do it right this is your question should i do it on a computer with a tactics training tactics trainer should i do it on an app should i do it with a book with boards and pieces and this is what i like to say um first of all it's not important how you do it but that you do it this is the most important i think any of those methods will yield benefits that being said I personally like the best printing them out um, or doing them in a book mm, because setting up each puzzle on a board takes some time. I mean, this is the best method to set it up on a board, but then you lose some time because you always have to um, set up the new position. And doing them on a computer screen, I think it's not that great or with tactics trainers because you might be tempted to, to play a move too quickly um, and not take it seriously enough. Because if you play a move, you immediately see a solution um, and you get that feedback. Whereas with the book or if you print them out, you don't get that feedback immediately. You can, you can solve several puzzles in a row and then you can check the solution so you don't get out of the flow every time um, i think that's the biggest thing you don't get out of the flow if you set it if you work with you with the board you kind of get out of the flow every time because you have to set up the board again you have to set up the pieces and same with the computer maybe if you have one wrong answer then you're gonna stop and check the solution and so on but if you do it in a book or on a piece of paper where you've printed them out, you can do one after 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 another and do a lot in a row, and then just uh, afterwards check the solutions. <clears throat> and Ian is also asking, how many should I be doing a day? Twenty puzzles daily. Well, I would not so much go after puzzles. You can do it too, the number of puzzles, but I would rather um, do just time. So you could say half an hour, an hour, okay, something like that. And that's, that's very simple. Just say, okay, I'll do half an hour um, and that's it, okay. And then you can kind of challenge yourself. You can say, okay, yesterday I did 15 exercises. Okay, let me see if I can beat this today. Let me see if I can do 16, 17, okay. Yeah, exactly, uh, Ian. If you if you have um, them on a computer, if you have an ebook or whatever, mm, you can just print it out. Or if you have a book, of course, you can just work with the book, and you can also write in the book. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Um, so those are certainly some ways. And very good question, Ian. Uh, um, good point how to how to go about solving tactics and yeah I think tactics training you never go wrong with that because like we saw today as well again um, tactics
just occur in every game and it really makes a difference whether you spot them or you don't. It really makes all the difference. So, <clears throat> and Ian says, I have your tactics ebook you did, which looks great. <laughs> well, thank you a lot. Um, so to everybody else, yes, I wrote, put together a little tactics ebook with how I go about solving tactics, what I recommend, and then uh, over 140 exercises with three different levels. So we have beginner, intermediate, and advanced. But this being said, it's still the advanced exercises are not that difficult. So Ian, you have to check whether they are difficult enough for you. Otherwise, get back to me. Get back to me, and I'll recommend to you some other some other books or you can check at the end of this ebook uh, Ian there are also some recommendations of books that are good for tactics training all right with that being said thanks everyone for watching and talk to you soon enjoy the rest of your Sunday